Our next speaker is uh, Professor Thompson, uh, Elizabeth Thompson, who is a, a Muhammad Farsi Chair of uh, Islamic Peace at the American University in Washington, D.C. Um, she has uh, three books. Uh, well, one is still in the making, I understand. Uh, her first book, uh, Colonial Citizens, uh, published by Columbia in 2000, uh, has won two prizes uh, for uh, literary excellence and academic excellence. And uh, her most recent book, Justice Interrupted, was uh, studies struggles for justice against the growth of tyranny, inequality, and foreign intervention since the late 19th century, I assume in the Middle East, because this is her focus. Uh, and uh, her new book also, as other books I mentioned, have a very um, enticing, interesting, uh, intriguing title, After Lawrence, uh, Woodrow Wilson and the Promise of Arab Democracy. Um, it, it, it is under contract with Grove Press for publication in uh, 2019. Yeah. Um, Woodrow Wilson is a unique president in that he was the only PhD holder among our presidents. Um, and uh, I also Super benefited guy. from my stay at Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. It's yes, uh, yes, myself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan, for organizing the conference, to Jessica for all her work in Nazarene, but also mostly to all you participants from whom I've already learned so much I want to rewrite my talk, but um, I will plunge ahead. I bring to our discussion on Islamic peace, I guess really my background as a historian of social movements, all right? Um, I humbly look for your input on my own take on um, the thinking um, and the historical importance for uh, uh, peace in the Middle East and ideas about uh, peace amongst Muslims and the um, uh, writings and the change of ideas that Ridda underwent after World War I. So I bring, I guess, to the discussion, I hope, this is sort of, I cannot match the clarity and the um, thoughtfulness of my predecessor. Um, this is from my new book, and so it's a little rough around the edges, but um, let's plunge ahead and look at some pictures, and I will, um, uh, you know, show you that uh, many of the points that you've made in papers yesterday and today, actually, now I realize I can boost them in my own thinking. For example, eh, we talked about Islamic peace. What's that, right? And here I'm going to argue that at this pitiful, pivotal moment, Ridda actually comes out of World War I believing in a universal model of peace, all right? He is still believing that Muslims and Christians can share values. It will be not the war, but the peace conference that will destroy that faith in universality, universal justice and therefore peace, and make emergent, I would argue, to him, but particularly to his followers, an idea that there is a distinctly Islamic peace opposite to, superior to, uh, other you know, European conceptions of peace. Um, we talked about rahma and uh, mercy and so on, um, and uh, the need for it to temper the fervor and the you know, desire for purity and current uh, struggles for justice. Ridda, of course, was not a Sufi himself, although he had his own visions and dreams, uh, right? But he did pe preach, and here, um, I haven't done so yet, but I have an old colleague who now teaches at Minnesota who was writing on Gandhi's idea of neighborliness, right? And I think that the, you know, there's, a, there's a strong element in his writings in Al-Manar right after the war about uh, brotherhood, and particularly with non-Muslims, as you'll see in a moment. He rejects the exclusiveness of Turkish nationalism, which is built on killing Christians and purifying Anatolia in that way. So you can see context matters, right? Um, I would argue um, in this particular paper and in my book that um, well, this is a, a, a critical moment in history. Historians look for these moments where events and decisions taken have long-lasting um, effects. Um, I would call this the last stand of what some people call liberal Islam, um, and that it dies not because people just change their minds, but because of actual events, which for a historian, 
influenced but beyond Foucault, influenced by post-colonialism, hopefully in the era of past colonialism, can say, you know, that uh, by untying the complications of this moment, we might unloose ourselves from the trap that uh, Rida and others had to walk into to find a new route to peace. So with, uh, with all of uh, that preamble, let me, how do I find, how do I change? Here, this is it. Yeah, introduction. Now the real introduction to the paper. In December 1918, here's an older Rida, um, uh, between the November 11th armistice of World War I and the opening of the Paris Peace Conference, Rashid Rida sat in his home office, yes, he had an home office, his printing press is right there in Cairo, uh, preparing a new issue of his famous uh, Islamic magazine, Al Manar. He had blogged the war since 1914, I think a forerunner perhaps of our own Juan Cole, <laughs> translating documents, summarizing battles for his readers, and so on. In October, uh, Arab and Allied troops had occupied Damascus and uh, the rest of Syria, and the Ottomans had signed their own armistice. To mark the start of a new era, Rida decided to publish a special introduction to the new volume of Al-Manar, volume 21. Here it is. Praise the Almighty, to the Almighty, the all-powerful one who created the universe with perfection, he began, invoking verses of the Quran, which you know better than I do, but which refer to the dawn after night and the day of resurrection. He is marking this. He's called the war the sort of small apocalypse, the small calamity, just a uh, musiba, right? But uh, uh, deliberately wanting to invoke in his readers <coughs> that, the, you know, the prospect of a much larger one. The hell of war, he wrote, is a warning, quote, a warning to all mankind, to any of you who choose to go forward or lag behind. Here we go. Uh, in this war, Ridda wrote, God's justice has prevailed. He has punished states that oppressed weaker nations. Russia, then Austria and Bulgaria, surrendered. And then the shadow of the Turks, receded from Arab, Armenian, and Kurdish lands, where the tyrannical unionists, here are a couple of them, you see, Enver Pasha, Pointer, and Jamal Pasha there, visiting Jerusalem in 1916, um, uh, you know, where the tyrannical unionists spilled blood. Their corruption surpassed all limits. God saved Europe from the German threat, he continued, by using, quote, the hand of the great nation least prepared for war. This is going to bring a tear to your eyes, by the way. The power farthest from seeking sovereignty over other nations and from ambitions over other countries. That nation is the United States of America. He hadn't read much about the Philippines, clearly. It tipped power in favor of the Allies with moral strength more than with its troops and material. Indeed, its president, Dr. Wilson, called for building peace on the basis of his proposed principles of truth and universal justice. That Ridda discerned the hand of divine justice in the Turks' defeat, fellow Muslims, and in the Americans' victory may surprise contemporary readers who regard him as the student of Jamal al-Din al-Afghani and the grandfather of the modern Muslim Brotherhood. Pictures. Uh, my presentation today uh, addresses Ridda's immediate response to the war and expectations for the Paris Peace Conference, as I mentioned, is a critical moment of far-reaching consequence for the way that Muslims would uh, conceptualize their relationship to other parts of the world, and particularly Arab Muslims in Syria and Egypt, where he held the most direct influence. Um, but also for relations with the outer world. And here we have a picture of the peace conference. While historians have spilled much ink on the diplomatic story of what David Frumkin called the peace to end all peace at Paris, almost no historians have actually linked the process of that peacemaking in Paris to the peacemaking being done by Arabs and Muslims themselves, right? Uh, if you read Frumkin, there's not one Arabic or Turkish source in the book, right? Uh, they, they're not actors shaping their own future. For political activists like Rida, however, peace in the Middle East could begin only with Arab sovereignty, and that peace would be guaranteed in the long term only, and this is the interesting, by uh, launching what he would call a revolution, a democratic revolution, both in international relations around the world, 
and within Arab society in Syria. So it was in 19, this is, we're done up there, okay? Third from the right. Um, so in 1919, Ridda would travel to Damascus to participate in the General Syrian Congress and the following year oversee ratification of a constitution for the Syrian Arab Kingdom. Right. The Congress produced what remains, in my mind, and I will argue this in the book, um, the most democratic constitution to date ever in the Arab world. All right. um, I humbly intend then this paper to bring to our conversation than um, a, a very self-conscious historical perspective and method to discussing peace. And now here I might suggest, um, maybe in the Q&A or over lunch or dinner, we'll talk about what the future of a field like Islamic peace studies might be, right? But certainly from a historical perspective, to grant people today the um, knowledge of past repertoires for peacemaking, and those of us who study politics, politics is by design, as long as you have a political arena and you're able to debate things in a parliament, right, or build a political movement and have the freedom to express an opinion and engage in debate, uh, you avoid violence, right? From the point of view of those of us who st study social movements, the violence comes when you shut down the political arena, right? So very much learning how are the ways in which we can create spaces uh, for peacemaking, but also to learn about the repertoire uh, that uh, Muslims and Mid Arabs and Middle Easterners and others have used before us as tools that might be used today is important. The other important thing that the historical perspective can offer us is to look at what exactly were the obstacles that derailed peace and how might then, once we understand what those truly are, we can talk about how to remove those, okay? So this is where I'm coming from a little bit. Um, as a historian then, you'll see, I'm gonna organize the, um, the talk um, uh, in three steps. One, to provide you context for the text. Historians insist, right, that you cannot understand, um, well, except historians who engage in the cultural turn, but I'm still too much of a social historian, right? The context matters. What he says is a reflection and embedded in the context and is also linked to his action. Um, those of us who noted that you cannot have thought without action or you should not, I will then go from context to discussing the text itself of that remarkable document, the issue of December 1918 in Amanar, and then to his action. I will end then with a, uh, a look at how Ridda's views will change regarding peace in response to the decision by Paris to destroy the state that these people created, all right? And that then will be the end of universal peace in his mind and the beginnings of a conceptualization of a peculiarly Islamic peace in the 1920s, all right? Um, so let's go to context. Ah, here's a picture of the issue, the war years, all right? Um, let's see. Ah, historians have recently argued that it was the war uh, that destroyed peaceful coexistence of peoples of different faiths in the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Particularly, Michel Campos and Abigail Jacobson have studied Jerusalem uh, to look at ways in which, for example, philanthropists cut a wedge between native Arab Jews and Zionist Jews, but also the ways in which the polarity, the looming threat of Christian rule, right, changed the status of uh, Christians in, say, further north in Syria. Salim Tamari uh, published a book called The Year of the Locust. It's about the famine um, and the hardship of people th seen through a diary of Ihsan Turjman uh, on your left. Um, uh, where he argues that Ottomanism in Palestine was erased during the war, right? The war, Tamari argued, quote, decisively undermined progress toward a multinational, multi-ethnic state and gave rise to narrow and exclusivist nationalist ideologies. Turkish historians as well, like Hassan Kayali and Talha Cicek, have argued that after 1914, Ottoman loyalists like Mohammed Kurdali, a Syrian on your right, um, uh, in Syria, along with the young Turks in Istanbul, 
now envision peace only possible if based on Muslim solidarity, Muslim only solidarity, all right? Um, in a kind of Darwinist ideology of national survival, they justified, here's a picture, uh, the killing of one million Armenians in massacres and deportations beginning in 1915. The Young Turks also planned Greek deportations and the relegation of non-Muslims to uh, labor brigades. They were not allowed to carry guns in the army, reversing reforms in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century that had granted citizenship to all residents of the empire and required everyone to serve their country in the army. They had to return to the idea of a Muslim-only army. Peace and the war's end would only be achieved in the eyes of Talat, Enver, and Jamal Pasha um, through the loyalty of a homogeneous Muslim polity and the end of the multi-religious Ottoman society before 1914. Now you might guess, given my tone and the way I phrase that, I have a problem with the idea that the war actually killed peaceful coexistence. I've written about the man on your left. His name is Ohanas Pasha Koyumjan. He was of um, Armenian family from Aleppo who grew up in Istanbul, rose very high in the foreign ministry in the Ottoman Empire, applauded the 1908 Constitutional Revolution, which restored the equal rights of citizens and so on, and became governor of Mount Lebanon right before the war. Needless to say, Jim Al Pasha found him to be quite a problem because the Young Turks had decided all Christians on, the Mount, on Mount Lebanon were traitors, and they wanted access to it. It was under a pr protective regime. Um, since the mid-19th century, and so they fired him. But what's interesting, if you read his 1921 memoir, is that Ohanis Pasha goes back to Istanbul looking for good old Turks, right? The CUP, the Unionists, are bad Turks, but he still believes there are good old Turks who are of the tolerant sort that had fueled the 1908 revolution. That speaks to me, this is an example of the lingering, what I call lingering liberalism. Uh, evident even after the war, okay? As this photo on your right of uh, war, uh, wartime relief being distributed to Armenians in Aleppo and other documents we know about the Muslim um, governor of Aleppo, there were many people in Syria who opposed the, uh, what was done to the Armenians and continued to believe in brotherly love, okay, uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims. Ridna's own Menar also expressed the lingering liberalism and belief in brotherhood at the end of the war. Um, oh, here, I have this, okay. Now, in um, November 1914, uh, the Ottomans had declared holy war uh, to rally, as uh, historians like Mustafa Aksakal now argue, primarily to rally ordinary Muslims to enlist in the army. Okay, there was an old idea that the British had put out that the jihad was really made in Germany, and I think that's been pretty well set aside by recent Ottoman historiography. The Turks eagerly amplified the Islamization of the Ottoman state, the military, and even of citizenship that had begun under Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Anwar Pasha saw the war as an opportunity, quote, to end, oh good, thank you, uh, Christian rule over Muslim peoples, all right? And so the jihad followed the cancellation of capitulation treaties. I don't know if you all, if you're a historian, you read uh, too much about capitulation treaties. They had, since the 16th century, granted Europeans uh, special privileges, tax relief, uh, their own courts, and so on. Um, exemption from customs duties, um, uh, but had been expanded to cover their um, largely non-Muslim clients, right? Um, one thing the Young Turks wanted to do in this war with the Jihad was to create a national bourgeoisie, <coughs> all right? So one motive for getting rid of the Armenians was to replace them with Muslim bourgeois, who would presumably reinvest more in the empire and contribute to its progress, all right? Um, so the same month, um, of the uh, Jihad Declaration, Ridda published an article in Al-Manar entitled The Abolition of Foreign Privileges and the Threat of Civil Strife. He was responding to articles being published here in Syrian American newspapers, all right, uh, sounding alarm bells. Oh, no capitulations, no protection from outsiders, right? 
And his goal was to argue to his readers of Amanar, no, they don't need outside protection because Islam says they are our brothers and we take care of them, right? Do not believe the devil's whispers, right? That, uh, you know, they're Christians because they have had relations with foreigners or they sympathize with foreigners are inherently treasonous. And he quotes the Quran again um, to warn people to avoid vigilante justice. Quote, the Islamic Sharia does not impose punishment on inclinations, on love or hate or matters of the heart. And all, moreover, it is the authorities, not you individuals, who uh, impose in punishment, all right? So he feared, in fact, that given the events as early as this in the war, in the fall of 1914, that there was word sent out that, uh, you know, it was uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, all Christians were fair game, right? We do know that there were attacks on Armenians on the Russian border uh, at this time, but I do not know, and he swore there was not at this point, uh, anything in Syria, okay? Um, he then further argued in that article that the Arab future must uh, rest on, quote, agreement with your race and with those not of your religion whom the Sharia grants equality in public rights. Okay. Three months later, Rida published another article emphasizing that jihad is not, a war, uh, not authorization of war on non-Muslims and not authorization to kill Ottoman Christians. The war has, in fact, brought Arab Muslims and Christians closer together. And here he's working with um, what, in retrospect, we understand is faulty knowledge. He has heard already of some of the first attacks on Armenians as early as early 1915. You know, the genocide order doesn't come out until the end of March, early April. But um, uh, <coughs> there are problems. Uh, but he says it's, oh, that, that is done on political grounds, not religious. It's not because they're Christians. It's because the Ottomans believe that they are in cahoots with the Russians, all right? important to him. So while Ridda wrote that Islamic war, um, uh, okay, and he emphasizes that Islamic law does not permit the killing of non-combatants above and beyond, uh, the Young Turks are not going to follow that rule, right? While he wrote that Islamic law and uh, war was more ethical than European law, Ridda did not sustain a polarized religious rhetoric about the war. All right, quote, for those who understand it, Christianity is a religion of peace and humility, he wrote. The more people in a nation who believe this, the more chance there is for peace. And this is in an article where he's writing in support of the conscientious objectors in England, in fact. And he's very impressed that the English are permitting them to do that. Again, his information is not always accurate. By 1917, he has shifted loyalties. He is no longer you know, giving the benefit of the doubt to the Turks. Um, and he has condemned. Uh, all sides for rejecting the peace initiatives by, uh, the, uh, by, Rid, uh, by Wilson and the Pope. Um, but he has now joined the Allies in condemning Germany, most of all, as most blameworthy for the war and looks forward to their defeat. Quote, may we ask Allah to grant victory to truth and justice, and here's the key, and to grant freedom to the oppressed nations. And here it is clear by then, uh, here we go, that Ridda counts the Arabs amongst the oppressed nations, right? He's already, we've already had the quote uh, that I've given you uh, about him being happy the Turks are receding by the end of the war. Um, he has turned against the Turks and has thrown his support to the Arab revolt. But while he praised the British for their war strategy and for supporting the revolt, he feared Britain's colonial aims, all right? In 1916, he tried and failed to unite Arab sheikhs in the Gulf into an association that could resist British imperialism, right? By so doing, he alienated both Sharif Hussein, right, who declared the revolt, um, that's his son Faisal, right, um, but also the British, who then warned him in, by 1917 to stay out of politics. Side note, I just can't resist. He's actually caught, talk about being, uh, you know, putting your words into action. He's actually caught in Mecca. Um, distributing scurrilous pamphlets that forecast that the French are going to destroy the Kaaba and take the Black Stone to the Louvre. You know, I, 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 who knows? This is, you know, uh, here's perhaps hearsay, but he had already gotten in trouble with the British because the British had tried to enlist him to send out agents to sound out Arab views toward them, and he'd armed those agents with Arab nationalist pamphlets, and um, so the British jailed them. So here's the response of Mark Sykes, the 
a co-author of the infamous secret treaty, right, that planned to occupy Arab lands, split them between the British and the French in 1916. Here he goes. He's reporting back to London. He, Rida, is a hard, uncompromising, fanatical Muslim, the mainspring of whose ideas is the desire to eliminate Christian influence and to make Islam a political power in as wide a field as possible. He said that the fall of Constantinople would mean the end of Turkish military power, and therefore it was necessary to set up another Mohammedan state to maintain Mohammedan prestige. Horror, right, in the mind of a true blue colonialist, um, uh, you know, this, could, this was only treason. Sykes then advised that Arab ulama like Rida are not open to negotiation. Force is the only argument they can understand. Sykes' misreading of Rida was, in fact, a denial of the sort of universal uh, model of justice and, you know, um, concert of, uh, of civilizations that I think Rida and his mentors had really embraced in the late 19th century, all right? It is a low point and a forerunner of changes to come after the war. Rida himself warned presciently the British, that annexation of Arabia, Iraq, or Syria would provoke Muslim hostilities. All right? Here, just to sort of give you another framework. Um, oh, there's Sykes, there's Mecca, and the poor Kaaba in 1916. All right. Um, but we might think of Ridda actually alongside many others. I could have put up pictures of Ho Chi Minh or um, uh, others in, at this time that are being written about in terms of the Wilsonian moment. People. The book is terrible because the book claims that Wilson gave these guys the idea that they should have self-determination. They are responding to they're saying, oh, finally somebody out there gets it, right? Um, but anyway, um, we might think of Rida as a forerunner of a lot of the anti-colonialist um, thought that would really uh, surge after the war, okay? Um, we do know that people in the Middle East are reading Gandhi uh, by this point, by the way. All right. On to, that's the context for which, all right, Rida's in hot water with the British. He has come out for independence at all costs and virtually to call for a revolution as the key to peace after the war, right? Um, and if you don't follow through on Rida's principles for reorganizing international relations, and if the Arabs don't step up to establish a, a society in which all people live in brotherhood and equality, then you're not going to have peace. He's already making these warnings. So let's go to, to the text um, that he decides to write uh, in late December 1918. At that point, Prince Faisal, Sharif Hussein's son, has already arrived in Europe preparing for the peace conference. All right. Um, Wilson, too, has arrived there to great fanfare and big parades, you know, and thousands. There's a lovely book on the thousands of letters Wilson received from French people but in a very different vein. The, the dominant uh, sentiment by the French is, thank God Wilson is going to give it to those Germans, right? And Wilson, I mean, Redda is praising Wilson instead for, uh, you know, as a man of much more abstract and universal, uh, you know, vision, right? Indeed, Redda barely mentioned Faisal in his issue uh, devoted to the post-war world. The North Star of Arab hope was to be not an Arab Sharif, but rather the American president. Half of the issue is devoted to translating four of Wilson's speeches given in 1918 and then juxtaposing those to various documents from the British and French to emphasize, on the one hand, the challenge that the Arabs have, don't listen to those British and French, it's Wilson who is going to deliver the peace for you, but also to warn the British and French that, hey, you did make some promises that you said you would agree with Wilson. All right. So in the preface to the issue, okay, he notes, Rida notes that Wilson called not just for peace among nations, but also the independence of their peoples and for equality between the strong and the weak. He would overturn the hierarchies of power around the world that are wielded by tyrannical kings, he told his readers. This was the victory of moral power over military and financial power, all those you know, materialistic kinds of power that were poised to battle all mankind, right? So for Rinda, this, at this point, the war is caused by modern materialism, not by Christianity, not by European culture, right? 
but by modern materialism run amok. And you know, there are still some Christians who remember the peaceful message of their thing, so on, right? So there's where he's coming from. We learn from all this that the real power is with the truth, all right? He sees the post-war moment as a brief window. Again, he goes into Quranic quotations warning people that, you know, so often once the memory of calamity fades, people, you know, forget about God again and they revert to their old sins and divisions and so on. And he warns his readers, after seeing the terrible consequences of war, the only peace in the world exists in equality and justice, leaving behind the politics of conspiracy and hypocrisy and of secret treaties, all right? The independence of peoples under the command of their chosen governments with, a constitution, with the constitution of a league of experts, he loves the idea of a league of nations, um, to judge disputes and the abolition of secret agreements, that is the key to peace, okay? Then he warns the great powers in the article. He says, if you don't do this, you will cause a fitna on earth, massive corruption, revolutions, widespread evil, and the return to war. All right, so he's kind of, see, he's, he's as pessimistic as Clemenceau. I wish I had a picture of George, of George Clemenceau, the French president, who already is absolutely certain that the Germans are coming back over that border really soon, okay? Um, to make the point clear, Riddett labels the section, and I'm not gonna have time to go through all the speeches, but um, the section where he presents Wilson's speeches, principles of the great social revolution and freedom of nations. Okay, so he makes it very clear to his readers, uh, you know, what is required for establishing peace. He quotes the 14 points which promise an impartial adjustment of colonial claims and promise autonomy, autonomous development to peoples of the Ottoman Empire. He quotes Wilson's um, Mount Vernon speech on July 4th, which made clear, and here I differ with some recent historians who said, oh, Wilson, you know, he was just a racist. He was really only thinking of white people in Europe when he was saying this. No, the quotes that Rick defines from these speeches speak otherwise, right? The Mount Vernon speech says um, that he promises a peace based on freedom and rule and law for all peoples of many races and in every part of the world. Okay, that's important to Rida. In the third selection, a pretty unknown speech Wilson made on September 27th in New York, was titled, Impartial Justice is the Price of Peace. Okay? It affirmed, quote, that the interest of the weakest is as sacred as the interest of the strongest and that the League of Nations would protect the rights of those weak nations, right? Now, Rida spends great space on commentary on this pretty unknown speech, quoting from the Cairo-based al Khattam newspaper, which remarked that the League of Nations would, quote, prevent the outbreak of another great war to afflict humanity and put an end to the social Darwinism that Europeans follow and restore um, a kind of, uh, well, actually, they thought of him as a kind of socialist, which would shock. Wilson, right? I don't think he saw himself as a socialist. Quote, so the small nations in all regions of the world raise their hands praying to God to prolong Wilson's life and to grant him the strength needed to realize his dreams. All right. Uh, the voice rising from America these days is a prophecy. Actually, Rita goes farther than Omukatam in praising Wilson and associating him with prophets. All right. Uh, Wilson, he wrote, speaks in God's voice. Quote, President Wilson is the one who proposed these principles of truth and justice, but he's not the first to call for them, for Allah has done so. All right, so he is giving point. Can you imagine, you know, today, a leading Muslim scholar, you know, hearing the voice of Allah in the American president's words? I doubt you, <laughs> you know, that that would happen, which is another reason to bring a tear to our eyes, all right? It is clear from what I've shown you, I hope, that uh, he Ridder did not, <coughs> Imagine a peace, an Islamic peace separate from a Christian or a European peace. It was, he was speaking in universal terms. Very briefly, the, second, the next section of this issue uh, was titled The Future of Syria and Other Arab Countries, where, interestingly, he goes into a discussion about taqwa. And how, you know, really, actually, the British have it. You know, they were very good at strategy in the war, and God favors people who step up, use their resources, and, you know, uh, work for uh, uh, their best future, and he will aid them, and that's what Arabs have to do. He is very worried about pro-colonial Arabs. There are some Syrians in Paris who 
have started promoting a, Sir a French occupation of Syria as a way to bring peace and to protect the Christians. And he's arguing against that. We have to make our own future. Quote, uh, you know, if Arabs miss this chance and choose slavery over freedom and independence due to the deceptions of colonial advocates, they commit self-destruction. More than that, they kill their entire nation. They will be cursed in history and the history of all nations. Here's Faisal um, clearly speaking to Faisal. Don't heed that. Don't make any deals. Um, I don't know if you'd like to know, but um, this is T.E. Lawrence, Nouri Saeed, who will become a dastardly corrupt minister in a post, uh, you know, in, in Iraq later. Rustam Haidar is a very close advisor from uh, Lebanon. All right. We'll move on to then how Rida's uh, words were backed up by action the Syrian Arab Congress. Oh, you're holding it very well. I know you're thinking about lunch. <laughs> um, okay, in September 1919, Rashid Ridda traveled from Cairo to Damascus expressly, he wrote, to found a Syrian state where Muslims and Christians would be equal citizens. Okay. This position was a rebuke to the pan-Islamist program that had fueled the Armenian genocide and the Turkish nationalism of the day. Uh, even as Rida traveled to join the Syrian Congress as a deputy from Tripoli, Mustafa Kemal, only some miles away, was organizing Turkish Congresses at Erzurum and Sivas. With a rump army, Kemal would fight a nationalist independence war against European occupation in Anatolia, cleansing Anatolia of remnants of the Armenians and forcing a population exchange that would expel Greeks, right? Turkey becomes, what, 98% uh, Muslim as a result. Rida and the Arabs, however, lacked an army and were forced, or if we are um, more optimistically minded, chose freely uh, a nonviolent and democratically inclusive path to their future and to independence. And so Rida would spend nearly a year. Oh, hold on. Here we go. You've seen this one, right? Yes. And there, I have marked him better on this one. Uh, nearly a year in Damascus, um, hashing out uh, the Constitution and organizing a government. He did not plan to. There's, if you look at his diary, there's all these little notes about worrying about his walk over in Kalamun and, you know, the Turks had taken it over and I have to get that and visiting friends in Lebanon. But no, he ch decides he actually becomes surprisingly quite friendly with Faisal, um, you know, despite all this criticism, as you'll see in, in just a moment. Rita supported the power of Congress, of the people, right, the representatives of the people, against Faisal's claims to royal authority, all right? Um, he had no problem reconciling. It's kind of funny to read later 20th century debates about Islam and democracy and whether you could have popular sovereignty, you know, as, a, as an Islamic state necessarily theocratic, and he seems to have no problem with the idea of popular sovereignty at all, right? Um, so he also denounced Faisal's negotiations with the French on grounds that they infringed on sovereignty. And in my last book, I won't, just a parenthesis, I argued after looking at uh, multiple constitutional movements in the late 19th, early 20th century in the Middle East that um, what brought together very large coalitions of people from different political persuasions was a common belief that if you have a constitutional government, you will secure sovereignty. But second part, which is less argued, sovereignty guarantees equality under one law. People were very angry about those capitulations and the sort of multiple systems of uh, law, which uh, Wang Cole pointed out very well in uh, as the case in, C in Egypt uh, in the late 19th century, right? And that people should really it's only fair to live under one set of laws, right? Um, but that that would strengthen the society block monarchs from selling out the country, right, um, and uh, assure your sovereignty and therefore justice, all right? As you'll see, I think people at this point are recapitulating that belief. So if you read descriptions of the 1908 Constitutional Revolution, which I have to point out, many of these people were part of, right? When they held elections for this Congress, they had to call up the, um, uh, the old deputy 
right? They didn't, it was very rush rush. They had to pull together this Congress to meet an American commission in the summer of July 1919. So uh, many of these guys had had that experience already. And if you read documents from that period, they too in 1908 thought, if we, pro if we prove to the Europeans that we can rule ourselves in a modern, tolerant way, maybe they will stop threatening to colonize us and tear apart our empire. So I think for many, uh, the, a similar motive took place. So, because I puzzled why it is that so many put their efforts into a Congress and writing a constitution, whereas there were others saying, we have to pick up guns. We have to just shoot these people as they come, right? Um, uh, which, of course, Mustafa Kemal did as well. All right, so on March 8, 1920, this Congress declared independence unilaterally to the horror of the Europeans and crowned Faisal king. It's a kind of bad picture, but we don't have a lot of them. All right. When the now King Faisal tried to dissolve the Congress, saying, OK, we're done. We've declared independence. I'm the ruler. It was Ridda who confronted him. Sovereignty belongs to the people, he said, and the Congress represents them. You cannot dissolve it because it was the Congress that made you king of Syria. And in fact, in the constitution that they devise, it would require a two-thirds vote to install a king. Okay. Here's a picture of Ridda with the first page of the constitution. Uh, he played a leading role in ratifying the Constitution, and in fact, I won't go into the detail now, he is the key mediator between kind of secular liberals who backed Faisal and much more conservative Muslims holdovers from that Ottoman uh, parliament, right? Um, and I'm convinced, although, you know, frustratingly, we don't have all the evidence I'd like, that he played a key role to keeping those two together. And in fact, I want to argue, it was the pressure to prove yourself, it was the pressure to establish a state after the war that brought people together who might have otherwise bickered, right? I mean, often, if you look even in American history and the history of our own constitutions, right, it is the pressure of a moment that often makes political compromise possible. And I think this was one of those moments. What is interesting is that the Constitution establishes a civilian parliamentary monarchy that limits the king's power through the legislature and by distributing power to the provinces. They actually, I pointed out Rustam Haidar. Rustam Haidar has in his hands a, a copy of Wilson's political science textbook. All right, it's called The State, right? And of course, guess which government in the, in the world is the most democratic and most modern in Wilson's eyes? The federal American government. They are really interested in the idea of federal government and devolving power down to the local level, and that's what they do in this Constitution. It also guaranteed equal rights of all citizens, regardless of religion, um, and it, most surprisingly, makes no mention of Islamic Sharia as, uh, Sharia as a source of legislation or as an official religion. Indeed, the only way in which Islam was institu institutionalized was by compromise. Ridda writes about this, right? That, uh, uh, he, say, he says, uh, you know, there were the secular, secular liberals who virtually really would rather have had a republic, right? And you had to kind of argue with them, well, you know, Faisal is a good figurehead for us, and, you know. Um, but also, he argued, these people in Syria have lived under a caliph for 400 years, you know, the Ottoman Sultan. Some of them still have loyalty to that man. You can't install a secular government, right? So they said, oh, okay, we'll make the king a Muslim, all right? To this day in the Syrian constitution, at least until a couple years ago, the president had to be Muslim. That gave the Alawis a little trouble, <laughs> right? They had to prove. All right, so. Um, very interesting, but Ridda says in, his, in Manar, in a later issue, why does he agree to this? Because he tells opponents, you know, conservative Muslims, he <coughs> says, Christian Syrians will not be equal under the law if you install Islamic law as a source of legislation, right? So it's very interesting because he will be associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, which will reverse that point of view. All right, he penned an article at this time as clouds were forming and as they were meeting to pass the, um, uh, the Constitution and as the British and th French threatened to sign in an agreement uh, putting in place a French mandate in Syria, he uh, publishes a final kind of last gasp article called The Aftermath of War in which he urges the British with their taqwa 
to uphold their sacred duty against French claims. And now that Wilson's speeches have floated into the air, you know, the American Congress has um, rejected the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations by April 1920. Um, you know, it is up to the British. A last gasp. I won't go into it, but Lloyd George's own granddaughter says he was a land grabber. And, you know, he was bound and determined to keep Palestine and Iraq. Therefore, he had to give Syria to France. Okay? So I think the true Dr. Evil in the story is Lloyd George. <laughs> it's the British looking for their territory. Okay. I have five minutes. Let's see what we can do. Um, I'll skip over yet another article. You have con I've convinced you. Here we go. Oh, yeah. This is San Remo Accord. Is signed at the end of um, uh, April 1920. You can see the French get Syria um, and will uh, send their troops across the border. There they are. Okay, this is General Zoy Bey, um, uh, uh, across the border and meet this remnant Syrian army. They have not put much effort into forming an army. On July 24th, Faisal would flee to Italy. Ridda fled back to Cairo, um, where, from where, he actually fought two more years against the League of Nations for Syrian independence. He still believed that that instrument set up by Wilson could deliver rights to weak nations. All right? He gave it two more years. He goes up to Geneva. We have a really nice picture. There he is in Geneva. This is Michel Lofala, who's the head of the Euro Palestinian Congress there. But as you all know, and we all know, the League of Nations would now is in the full control of the British and the French, and it votes to uh, uphold the award of a mandate to France in 1922. I argue that 1922 is a much more bitter moment for Ridda, right? The, act, the instrument of international law and justice created after the war is actually the instrument used to colonize Syria, putting an end to his hopes for peace and justice. In fact, I'll argue, it denies Arabs humanity. They are not really a member of the family of nations. They are like people of color. I have a chapter in the book where I compare uh, the Arabs at uh, Paris with W.E.B. Du Bois, and, you know, who, who clearly is not white and cannot hope for full rights, but the Arabs could try to fudge it. They still think they have a chance in 1919. In 1922, no. They are cast with peoples of color into the colonial world where you don't get human rights, okay? That's, that is the way it is read. It is a, a, a deep, deep betrayal. The lesson told Arabs is that force, not law, must govern nations, and that liberal politicians like Ridda were fools who had been betrayed. That has, and I won't go into all of the detail, um, but that plays out in the 1920s in a turn. Here is Ridda, who again, firmly believing you cannot have justice without sovereignty, will grow closer to the one sovereign, you know, Arab Muslim state, uh, the Saudi state. This is Hashem and Tassi, who is also in that Congress in Syria, by the way. Um, right? But more importantly, and here I'm skipping over a lot. We can go through it. Right? Um, uh, he writes, and had warned, actually had warned in 1919 that if the Europeans colonize and divide Arab lands, they will make clear that international law and justice are intended for Christians only, right? So he understands that moment as the end of the universal ideal of peace, the rise then inspiring followers like Hassan al-Banna to found the Muslim Brotherhood, and I argue this, and I'd love your feedback since you guys are like far more experts on issues of religion than I am, but that there's a premise behind the Muslim Brotherhood is that there is an Islamic world of justice, quite distinct, if not even antipathetic, and, you know, opposed to that world in Europe, right? That it ins institutionalizes a division and the end of any kind of universal belief. Ridda writes, and I'll end with this, I guess, uh, nobody, quote, nobody anymore believes the word of Europeans, nor does anybody trust them, or even perceive them to be qualified to exercise justice and virtue. One last po post note, and this is um, maybe not interesting or maybe interesting. Um, I would like in the final uh, chapter of the book to pursue consequences along the lines of also the cleavage that opens between Islam and liberalism at this moment, right? Um, 
and, uh, and nationalism, of course, that uh, produces a, a, an increasingly violent politics in the Middle East, you know, symbolized partly with the polarization that will happen in Egypt by the 1950s between the Muslim Brothers, Saeed Qutb, and uh, the mistreatment, right, the, the uh, brutality and the violence used by that state to repress them. Um, and I would like to read, and here I'd love your feedback, 2011 as an attempt to pull those two back together. You know, had we, through, over the course of a century, you know, or is this, is this a post-colonial moment where we're still living with the divisions, right, of liberal versus Islamic that uh, uh, bequeathed by, you know, colonial thinking, right? Um, we are modern liberal Europe as opposed to Islam, right? Um, or could this potentially have been a past colonial moment in the, uh, uh, the words of uh, Professor Naim? Obviously, we know the answer. These people came out in favor of a constitutional democratic government in June of 2012, only to see it demolished. Here I have a, a picture from Syria, much more dire consequences there. I'm interested that, again, we have a mixture. We have many religious people voting and supporting the liberal trend in politics. So by looking at that moment of cleavage, uh, but one caused by an international encounter, not by the essential cultural predilections or principles within Islam, might we open up ways of envisioning a way forward in the future? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Thompson. Your paper is as illuminating as it is sad in its <laughs> conclusions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it is open to questions and comments. I guess I'll ask a question that's relevant to the last slide. If, if, um, oh, sure. <laughs> if he was alive today, what would his position be on the Syrian civil war? Oh, my goodness. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, <clears throat> I might defer to people who uh, know his writings more deeply than I do, but I would. I would be surprised if he would not see Bashar al-Assad as another unionist, willing to sacrifice the lives of his own people for a state, right? Um, but others may want to weigh in and uh, kind of give their, uh, their sense. I don't know that he would, obviously, be, he, he wouldn't sympathize with some of the more rigid Islamic groups opposing Assad either. So. He might be sitting there in Istanbul with the, you know, wheelless Syrian National Council or something. I don't know. The, uh, yeah, of course, these are uh, questions that historians are uncomfortable with because they're counterfactual. But I, I think he almost certainly would have supported the 2011 revolution. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but um, uh, he wouldn't have been happy about the rise of the Salafi jihadis as the kind of vanguard of that revolution later on, because he, um, he despite his um, political uh, dallying with the Saudis in the 20s, he, he actually has a strong critique of Wahhabism and, uh, as opposed to Sunnism. And he says that the distinction is this. That in uh, Wahhabism, whatever is not mentioned in the Quran and Hadith is suspicious. It's it's the default is you should reject it if it's not there. This is why early Wahhabis, you know, really hated radio, not not mentioned in the sources. Uh, uh, Marconi didn't, you know, consult uh, a Muslim before he did that. But uh, then he says that the difference is that in Sunnism, the default is. If it's not mentioned, it's allowed. So it's the opposite of Wahhabism. So I think that despite the fact that these people call themselves Salafis, they actually have nothing to do with the real Salafi tradition, which is uh, uh, Afghani, Abdu, and Rida, which I, I think what they are are stealth Wahhabis. They're, they're people who uh, basically have adopted some premises from Wahhabism and who nevertheless don't want to be seen as having left Sunnism. And in this era, Wahhabism was not accepted as Sunni. Uh, so um, I think he'd be very unhappy uh, with how things turned out. I mean, uh, maybe I'm guilty of projection because I'm kind of telling my own story here. But <laughs> 
what is true, Omar Riyad, uh, who's written a book and uh, is working further on uh, her that he's an Egyptian scholar in Collins, right, um, makes a forceful argument that uh, Banna misrepresents his relationship to uh, the Wahhabis and his own relationship to Rida, and that he and Rida did not see eye to eye on the expand, you know, because Banna is all about expanding the umbrella of Sharia, right, and Rida was very emphatic on there being boundaries. I don't, I didn't go into it here, but um, one tactic and one, one, the one reason he was able, I'm not going to call it a tactic, because it was a profound principle he had developed by that point, the one reason he was able to be the successful mediator in 1920 between liberals and conservative Muslims was that he had a robust um, uh, uh, idea about al maslaha al amma right, the public interest as being beyond the boundaries of Islamic law. Um, so, like a, in one chapter of my book, I'm going to have them engage in a debate on women's suffrage. You know, and a sheikh from Gaza gets up and he says, of course women should have the right to vote. They are equal under God. And a sheikh from Hama, you know, these guys in the, uh, in the Congress gets up and says, oh, no, 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 women must obey their husbands. They have no independent mind. No, can't do that. Right? And then a sheikh from Gaza gets up. It's had a very telling uh, debate. Uh, says, oh, but what will those people in Paris say about us, you know, weakening and disenfranchising half of our population if they don't, if we don't give women the vote, right? Women didn't have the vote in Paris. Yeah. No, they didn't, right? <laughs> exactly. But he doesn't know that. It's great, you know, but they have this idea. Um, and at that point, the conservatives storm out of the room. And, you know, they get up, they, oh, do we have a quorum? Do we have a quorum? Yes, okay. And at that point, Ridda stands up. Everybody claps. And he says, you're both wrong. Women's suffrage is not a matter for Islamic law. Both of them had justified their view of the women's suffrage in terms of their readings of Islamic law. He says, it is not, does not come under that. You know? But on the other hand, being a pragmatist and looking to the public interest, we have a French army over the border ready to pounce on us. We also have a mob outside our doors that will run amok if we give women suffrage. I'm sorry to say there are people in our society who feel very strongly against this. This is not the moment to give them suffrage, right? But in order to make clear where we stand, we will put into the, con let us put into the Constitution a provision that girls, as much as boys, must go to school, that we will educate our girls, right, um, and so on. So he, you know, he didn't want to give away the point, but again, at that particular moment, our interest was to establish a state and look unified to outsiders. So, um, very much would not have, uh, you know, sided with the more rigid side. But I, yeah, I don't know how we would have felt about Mohammed Morsi. I think some of the more liberal, younger members of the Muslim Brotherhood might have been more of his, uh, to his taste. I don't know. Thank you, uh, Professor Naim. Uh, I just a very quick question. Uh, there was a black man in one of the pictures that you brought oh, up. Yes. Uh, with uh, Faisal at, at Paris? Yes, in the back. He was standing. No, keep going back. Uh, no. There, it's, uh, yes, yes. Now, was he just security or was he. <laughs> <laughs> he is referred in texts as Faisal's slave. I forget his name. They have slaves down there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe until 1960. So, yeah. Some would argue still today. Yes. Uh, yeah. But you could go and buy a slave when you went untouched. You know, um, so yeah. He uh, was not that much of a Democrat, right? Um, but he is, you know, free the slaves. Questions, comments? Thank you all so much.